Hello, everyone. Welcome to our last session of our special series of seminars on the impact of the war in Ukraine on European integration. And this concludes a, a series of sev seven seminars that we had on various aspects where the impact has been almost immediate on the European uh, Union. And today's session is on enlargement, a very topical issue, especially with last week's or two weeks ago um, announcement of the candidate um, country status of, uh, of Ukraine, but also with other countries in the, in, in the, in the waiting uh, room, including Moldova, Georgia and the Western uh, Balkans. And um, we have a bit of different seminar today, I think because until now we have addressed uh, issues of deepening of European integration, whereas today it's a widening, widening uh, of uh, the European uh, Union. And obviously this can be linked very closely also with enlargements in other um, uh, types of unions, for example, the accession of uh, Sweden and Finland in, in NATO. The, there are overlaps that we are going to uh, explore. And we are particularly fortunate today with a session that is going to be introduced by Bridget Laffan. Uh, a, a very warm welcome back to the Robert Schumann Center. Bridget has been the director of the Schumann Center for uh, many years until very recently, and we are delighted to have you back, uh, even if this is an online only uh, session as you are in uh, Dublin and people started to move around for, for, for the summer. So I think we are ready uh, to start. Bridget, I don't know if you have slides that if, yes. if you would like to share. Yes. Um, you can try to share your screen. So I think I have su uh, successfully. Yes, it works. So I, I leave the floor to you. And okay. after your uh, in, in input, we'll have a discussion. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, thank you very much, Daniela. And thank you all. And lovely to see so many familiar faces. Uh, and I really want to congratulate uh, uh, Daniela and the EGPP team for this series, because I think one of the a great glories of the Schumann Center is its ability to basically get an academic but also a policy discussion going on all of the hot topics pretty quickly. So I think this is uh, this is a very uh, this is a, another example of that agility and adaptability of Schumann, uh, which I value very much. So uh, what I'll talk about today, firstly, I think uh, it's important to state that there's no doubt but enlargement will be a core EU agenda item for the next certainly two decades, but perhaps three, but I would say probably two. Secondly, I think the link between the internal dynamic of integration and the external, the interaction and intersection between these dynamics is even more, will be more acute in this period than before. And thirdly, it is all of this will happen at a time of major global shift and shock in geopolitics and geoeconomics. So it's not that this is entirely different to processes of enlargement in the past, but I do think because we're in one of those historical switching points, uh, the dynamics are much, the dynamics between the global, the regional, the member state, the neighborhood, uh, the interaction, as I said, and intersection uh, are, are very dynamic and there is a lot of contingency there. So I'm not about to make uh, any great predictions. What I would like, I'd like to do three things. Firstly, to start with some empirics and theory. Secondly, uh, the current dynamic up to uh, this wave of enlargement up to the 24th of, um, of February. And then the response in the system to the war in Ukraine and some of the ideas that are floating out there uh, as to how the EU can or should respond to what's happening. So let's begin with a map. Uh, and this map tells a lot. Firstly, 
the original EU was a small EU. It was a EU, a club of the defeated in the war. It was the core Central European, that, that way, that band of city states uh, and France. Uh, and it was, if you look, there's also one other dimension. Uh, you see the blue in North Africa, because at the time, of course, this was pre-decolonization uh, and Algeria was part of metropolitan France. And of course, we look to the right, and that's a very, very different EU. That's a post-Cold War EU. Uh, but as you see, it also shows uh, the first time a country left the EU, because you have the United Kingdom in white, uh, you have Switzerland in the centre, the Balkans, Norway, and then, of course, the neighbourhood to the east. So that's a very, very different EU. Enlargement has had a dramatic impact on the EU. And let's look at the, uh, at, at the number of times the EU has expanded. And the EU expanded in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and even the last decade, although albeit for one country. So multiple accessions, altering the politics and scale of scale in the EU, the heterogeneity in the EU and the policy mix. Now, if you look at all of those enlargements, perhaps rather than seven, you could reduce them to five uh, geographically. Uh, but also, if you look, the scale of enlargement is very different. Uh, the, the rounds of enlargement have brought anything from one country in to 10 countries. The Big Bang enlargement, of course, of 2004 being the most dramatic enlargement that the EU has ever had. But there is an important distinction between pre and post Cold War enlargement. Up to the end of the Cold War, the collapse of communism, the EU expanded to include six more states, quite limited. Uh, and then post-16, and as we know, there's a very large number of uh, countries out there who want to join. I would argue that there is a tendency to think that enlargement is something that happens to the EU. And I think we need to think about it rather as something that's been intrinsic to the dynamic of integration, of European integration from the very beginning. And even though there were no enlargements in the 1960s, that didn't mean that there weren't enlargement politics in the 1960s. They were very divisive for countries applied to join and those applications were vetoed not once, but twice in the 1960s. So that enlargement is a built in, that politics of, 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 of scale is built into the dynamic of integration. And of course, won't run out, uh, will only run out when politically, and in my view, it will be political rather than geographical, when the EU determines what its borders, what its borders are. At some stage, uh, that's going to become a more stable thing. But it certainly isn't stable now uh, because the EU has one of the dimensions of integration that has remained unsettled from the beginning is unsettled borders and boundaries. We have all of those countries, candidate countries out there uh, in the Western Balkans, Albania, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, Albania uh, and Turkey. And now the two new candidate states uh, as of this month, Ukraine and Moldova, but then we have three potential candidate countries out there, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo and Georgia. So there is a lot of politics of enlargement left in all of that, uh, geographically, the Western Balkans uh, and also um, uh, to the east. And it's this latest wave is the uh, is the eastern wave uh, from former Soviet, former uh, Soviet parts of the Soviet Union, republics of the Soviet Union. And it was assumed that the three Baltics uh, were the lucky countries. They got out of the, so the uh, Soviet Union, they got into NATO and they got into the EU with relative ease. And of course, we see for uh, Ukraine, 
uh, that there is uh, that the post Cold War uh, security settlement is being unravelled uh, as I as I speak. So unsettled borders will will really be a central part of what the EU has to deal with and manage in the next period of integration. Now, in terms of what, what's the legal framework for joining the EU, the constitutional framework, and it's uh, Article 49, uh, so a European state must respect the values in Article 2 and committed to applying them. In terms, there's some process material in this article. The European Parliament and national parliaments shall be notified of applications. The application is to the uh, Council, which acts unanimously after the Commission, and the Commission gives its opinion. So the Commission is also a central actor and the consent of the Parliament. Then the conditions of eligibility are to be worked out by the European Council, which means that conditions of eligibility can change and they have changed. Uh, the EU has added condition, uh, conditions of eligibility from the Copenhagen criteria, but also post Copenhagen, uh, they've added other dimensions. Uh, and so the, it's, there's an accession treaty, it must be a, a, an international legal treaty between the member state and the applicant state. And of course, ratification relies both on the constitutional requirements of the candidate applicant to seeding country, but also of all of the existing countries. So there, there, is, there are firstly normative prescriptions here, geographical prescriptions here, process some process prescriptions but not a lot the process is to be designed and enacted by the institutions now in terms of theorizing integration and here I, i'm glad frank is here frank schimmelfenning because i think he and uli sedelmeyer did a tremendous made a tremendous contribution in the 2000s to theorizing uh, enlargement they act they identified the gaps and the fact that enlargement was effectively under theorized. They very quickly understood that the post Cold War uh, was a, a game changer for enlargement. And certainly enlargement was neglected in the early uh, literature on, on integration. If you think about the uniting of Europe, Haas or uh, 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 Europe's would be polity or uh, Europe's would-be polity. These were the, these basically concentrated on the internal dynamic of system formation and policy reach of the EU. And because enlargement was not at that time, although it was an issue, it wasn't in prospect when those volumes were written. It was in prospect, but not a reality, I should say. Then that's one reason why. Uh, but also it was that emphasis on uh, the deepening. And of course, there were also limited numbers of enlargement up to the end of the Cold War. But it took until about 2013 for enlargement policy and practice within the EU, in a sense, to go off the boil, that it was as if the system the EU system had made an enormous effort to come to terms with that Big Bang enlargement and the succeeding enlargements related to that, uh, and enlargement fatigue set in. Uh, but one of the one of the important developments from an EU perspective in this during this period is that the EU and Europe became synonymous in discourse. Uh, in other words. The EU colonized the concept of Europe. And if you think back to the rhetorical claims made by the countries of East Central Europe, they defined their efforts to join the EU as returning to Europe, 
And it was, um, if you notice, there is, uh, it strikes me as somewhat ironic that you get a lot of British commentators today, but never comment, uh, made any reference to this when the UK was a member state, but suddenly make it very clear that the EU and Europe are not synonymous and they want to make that claim. But that's precisely because of the success of the EU in colonizing in, in ensuring that the EU and Europe became synonymous in, uh, in, in political discourse, but not just in political discourse. Even in all of our writings, we tend to use EU and Europe interchangeably. Uh, and that's uh, in terms of the politics of enlargement. And here, uh, this, uh, this comes directly from, Fra um, from Frank and uh, uh, Uli, the four, they identified the four dimensions of the politics of enlargement. And these, I think, still hold. Firstly, the politics and policy of the candidate countries, how they position themselves domestically, how uh, enlargement is processed within the domestic political system. Is it a consensus issue? or a contested issue? Is it elite level or is there public support? What level of public support? And one of the things to always look at uh, with candidate countries is if there are if there's more than one country applying at that time, and there usually is, how those countries play the transnational, because they, they countries always, it's a bit like Georgia today, it doesn't like the fact that it was put into a different status. Uh, than Moldova and Ukraine. So there's a lot of politics in the candidate countries. Of course, there's also a lot of politics in the member states, because for, for each member state, enlargement alters the EU that they are a member of. Not just that, but it alters the policy mix it alters the geographical, uh, the center of gravity. It alters so much about the system that they have uh, signed up to, that they have ratified and, and are applying its, its, its a key. And you do, there are pretty embedded enlargement policies in different member states. For example, the departed United Kingdom was very pro-enlargement. Uh, Germany, by and large, has been pro-enlargement. France, much more reticent. But it's all based on uh, geography, a set of preferences, but also the policy mix. Interestingly, from the 1960s onwards, countries have not vetoed in any serious way the final accession of a member state. They haven't, they've made it more difficult from time to time. And they have, for example, we have Bulgaria with North uh, Macedonia, but countries are reticent to use the veto on a, on a candidate state. That doesn't mean that will hold forever, but there haven't been many de Gaulle's around uh, following the 1960s. The two other dimensions, EU collective enlargement politics, the macro, the polity, and the micro, the policy. And then, of course, there's the long-term systemic impact of enlargement on the EU. And all we have to do is recall that map to realize just how systemic it is. In terms of definitions of enlargement, and here again, uh, drawing on the I.O. literature, uh, the base enlargement has been seen as a gradual process of horizontal institutionalization, in other words, widening versus or intersecting with vertical institutionalization, deepening. Now, because I'm not going to use uh, this framework, uh, I just want to flag that depending on the research question, then either the rationalist theories or the cons or, or constructive theories are more or less are, are more or less appropriate. But I want to make the point that uh, when Frank and uh, Uli looked at this, they really looked at it from the perspective of the I.O. literature, the international organization literature. Now, I want to make an argument that we should also think in terms of polity formation 
and the insights from Roken, because that process of state and nation formation told us a lot about the, about historical contingency, about territorial structuring over the long durée, and about center periphery dynamics. And I would argue that if we look at particularly the post Cold War enlargement, but even the first enlargement to include Ireland, that was a country way below the per capita incomes of the time, the Iberian and uh, the Mediterranean enlargements, and then the Eastern enlargements. There have been very strong core periphery dynamics at play. And of all of the member states that have joined the EU since its inception, 77% of new member states have had per capita incomes below the EU average at the time of accession. And that means that European integration has had a, an extraordinarily strong magnetic attraction for Europe's peripheries. And you can think almost of that noyau dur at the beginning, extending north, south and east. And if we look at the candidate states in the Western Balkans, they're all, uh, they're all very poor. Also, I think uh, Roken helps us focus on center formation and what's required, and also on geopolitics and borders. Uh, and we're now in a phase of hard geopolitics and borders becoming much more salient, both globally and in Europe again. And then finally, that center periphery dynamic, uh, the EU, all European states, even those who would prefer not to like the United Kingdom, have to reach some kind of consensus with the EU. You can't, even though they try very hard not to use, uh, even to refer to the EU anymore, uh, they, can't, uh, they can't get away with it. It is, if you're a European state or in the European neighborhood, you must have an accommodation with this system. Moving then to the second part of the talk, and that's the, the recent past in terms of enlargement, and that's the saga of the Western Balkans. The EU, post the collapse of, uh, post the collapse of Yugoslavia and the Dayton Accords, mm -hmm. saw the stabilization of that part of Europe as important. There was also, we forget, but there was quite a strong uh, migratory uh, push from the Western Balkans to Europe at the time because of the war. And the EU started out with the same instruments that it used, adapted with East Central Europe, a stabilization and association process, and offered as er acknowledged as early as 2003 that these countries are potential candidate states. And that's almost 20 years ago. And when we look at it, yes, Albania has applied, it's got a favorable opinion, it's got candidate status, North Macedonia equally, Montenegro has accession negotiations, but they're slow, Serbia accession negotiations, but slow, and uh, Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina still potential candidate states. And when we look at the Western Balkans, uh, firstly, there are a lot of micro states there, you have Montenegro, 0 0.6 million, countries of 1.8 million. These are, apart from Serbia with 7 million, these are small or micro states. And the EU, of course, has lots of small and now an increasing number of micro states. And the, the dynamic between the large and the small uh, in the EU becomes an issue if you have, if the system develops what one might, I think the economist called it one time uh, before the Nice Treaty, the tyranny of the tiny. So there are real challenges in there for the EU. But of course, it's not just the fact that they're small. These are small and unstable. There has been a stagnation of domestic reforms. There has been resistance in the candidate countries 
to those reforms. For example, Serbia was downgraded uh, by Freedom House to partially free. Mind you, uh, Freedom House has also downgraded EU member states. But there are issues of media freedom, the rule of law, uh, and of course, the EU itself has learned painfully and has not got on top of the rule of law crisis within the union itself. It has learned painfully of the weakness of the internal instruments that it has in dealing with backsliding, not just the weakness, but with the challenge of uh, amassing sufficient political will and capacity to react. And of course, the Western Balkans was not a priority to the EU. Yes, the EU understood that it needed to do something to give a European perspective. It talked the talk. But over the last decade, the EU has been much more concerned. Eurozone, refugee, pandemic, and of course, now the war has altered that. And there has also been resistance within the member states. Uh, if you remember the French uh, insisting on uh, changes to the accession process in uh, 2019. And it's also been, the Western Balkans has been a very active place for other powers, particularly Russia and China. So the Western Balkans has been an issue on the EU agenda that was never sufficiently hot or sufficiently, that was never sufficiently compelling to, that the EU had to really address uh, the, the challenges therein. And of course, it's, that's described in the EU as enlargement fatigue. Uh, and I think that's an accurate description of what the system experienced uh, in the last in the last decade. Uh, the EU is concerned about its capacity to absorb and its capacity to govern itself, both in terms of policies and administration. And then there's also resistance uh, in some EU member states, and certainly public opinion across Europe is not that pro-enlargement, or at least in this period was not. Uh, and there's also questions of the political and economic legitimacy of uh, the, these countries and accommodating them in the EU, that it went from fatigue to also pretty active resistance. Juncker didn't want to talk about it. He stated in his um, in his in a state of the union very, very early on in his mandate that he didn't envisage enlargement. Uh, and then we had Macron in 19 which meant the von der Leyen Commission coming into office at the end of 19 had to try to kickstart uh, the enlargement process again. And the commission came up with enhan an enhanced accession process, which I will talk about uh, later. The elements of which are probably broadly right, uh, but uh, it's trying to get the nuts and bolts to stick. Moving on to the third part, obviously, everything changed on the 24th of February. And it wasn't just the, uh, it wasn't just the invasion of Ukraine, but it was the capacity of Ukraine itself to resist that invasion that has been absolutely crucial. Because had uh, the tanks rolled into Kyiv and had the Russians as they expected, had an early victory in Ukraine, then the EU and NATO and the US would have wrung their hands, insisted on sanctions, no doubt about sanctions, but wouldn't have had to confront the fact that Ukraine was determined to survive. And as Ukraine survived and as the uh, as Russia failed to take Kyiv quickly and had to withdraw, then that altered the impact of this war, not just on, on, on the EU, but on NATO and the Euro-Atlantic uh, dimension. The EU response was very speedy to Ukraine. It was much more um, determined than anyone could have predicted. I think Putin got it wrong. He expected uh, 
Europe and the, the West uh, to, to basically respond a la Crimea, and this is not what happened. The European Council met immediately, and the EU framing of, uh, of this war was that war has returned to Europe, force and coercion are being used to change European borders, uh, although that was exactly what happened in 2014. Uh, but somehow or other, <clears throat> this was a line in the sand. This was different because there was uh, a sense that Crimea was a contested place, but uh, the whole of Ukraine not. Uh, the responsibility for the war was uh, pinned very much on Russia. Uh, the identification of the invasion as illegal and a violation of international law, and that Russia would be held account. So the initial EU framing was all about uh, framing the war and all about Russia. But then we come to Versailles, and Versailles was only the 10th and 11th of uh, the 10th and 11th of uh, March, where suddenly the impact of the war on the EU is center stage. Yes, there's a reiteration of war has returned to Europe, but there's an acknowledgement of the strategic challenges of the war uh, to Europe. There is the beginning of a, a mapping out of a strategic agenda in areas like energy, defense, et cetera, et cetera, and then enlargement. And the EU was not at that stage, even though uh, Ukraine had applied for membership by this time. It certainly was not going to concede candidate status, but it went beyond the association agreement formula, which was that Ukraine was part of the European family. And that then meant that the EU had to respond once Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia applied then the EU had an obligation to respond. Uh, what I find uh, intriguing is that uh, Ukraine, in the midst of a war, manages to reply to the Commission's uh, questionnaire. Every can potential candidate state is sent a rather long questionnaire by the Commission in terms of where it's at, in terms of the key, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, you Kiev understood that in wanting candidate status, it had to play the process game, and so it did. Uh, it was there was a lot of debate across the capitals and a lot of unease uh, about granting candidate status for for good reason. This is a country, particularly Ukraine, at war. But of course, that's also the reason it got candidate status. Uh, and once van der Leyen, uh, von der Leyen had uh, visited Kyiv again, then clearly there was a strong signal from the Commission that the Commission opinion would be favourable. And then you had the four European leaders going to Kyiv. So at that stage, it looked as if uh, that the EU would cons would would offer candidate status. Uh, it wasn't yet indicated to whom, but the Commission opinion was clear that Ukraine and uh, Moldova should not be separated from Ukraine, but Georgia Georgia should. And the criteria were very much the um, uh, the original Copenhagen criteria. The, that uh, the political criteria, the economic, and the ability to implement the acquis. But the ability to Im implement the acquis was originally seen by the EU as, as the capacity to, to basically translate the acquis into domestic law. But from about 93 onwards, the EU was also concerned about the administrative or what I would call state capacity of a candidate state to actually be a viable uh, member state. Roll on to the 23rd and 4th of June. Uh, the, uh, the Council recognises the, Euro the European perspective, uh, the status is granted, and again the signal from the EU that it's not just the merit of each member state or each candidate state, but also the capacity of the EU. In other words, that link between internal and external, the intersection and interaction. Now, how does the EU deal with this? 
there has been the re-emergence of uh, a debate on differentiated integration and enlargement. And that means our Individu project uh, will certainly we can build on uh, because a very important dimension of that project was the distinction between internal and external DI. Uh, and particularly, we had a lot of work on external DI. I would say that we need to think about the distinctions between multi-speed, which effectively are shared goals with, a, with agreed and shared ends and multi-ends. In other words, uh, whereby uh, differentiated integration would not necessarily lead to full membership. And of course, when talking about DI and uh, enlargement, uh, one has to look at geography uh, and inevitably concentric circles uh, are part of the debate and also sectoral or the policy men uh, menu, the a la carte or uh, selective membership of selective parts. And of course, as our work has already shown, uh, there have been multiple modes of differentiation in the EU. Uh, and given the audience here, I don't need to go into this. So what are the ideas out there? And this is very selective because this is bubbling. There is basically uh, everyone's having their say on uh, think tanks and academics, politicians on what sorts of formulae might the EU need for the next phase. So Andrew Duff has always, he, 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 had a, he wanted to strengthen associate status way back in the 2000s. Uh, but now that the UK has left, he talks a lot about affiliate membership and that this should be a form of membership written into the treaties that would allow the EU to develop close economic and cultural partnerships. Uh, and that affiliate states would have greater access to EU institutions than under any of the existing uh, under any of the existing association agreements. It would be open to any existing member to leave the EU and full membership and become an affiliate. But in order to keep this system together, he argues for a stronger federal government at the centre and a European Security Council. Now, when you look at Duff, he really wants or advocates a very high level of institutional access for the affiliates, that there would be a commissioner responsible for them, that they would have a right to attend all council uh, meetings at every level as consultant, that they would have a presence on EP committees as observers, that they'd have automatic right to agency, they would participate in uh, Comatology and even have privileged access to the court and to some citizens' rights. So that's a very high level of polity engagement uh, from uh, Andrew Duff. Now, Enrico Letta, not dissimilar, but he doesn't actually he doesn't actually argue for high levels of institutional uh, access. He argues for sectoral reform. He calls it the seven unions. Uh, and then concentric circles with a highly integrated federal core and a wider European confederation. And for him, the issue is not access of uh, those countries in the concentric circles to the institutions, rather it is the need to overcome the veto and unanimity in the EU. And then we have uh, the one that comes from a political actor who will be in power in Europe over the next period, and that's Macron's uh, European political community that he advocated uh, on the 9th of uh, on the 9th of May Europe Day. And it has extremely strong resonance with Mitterrand's European Confederation that he launched 89 to 91. Uh, this organization would be a wider circle of cooperation. Now he does say that it wouldn't prejudge uh, future membership of the EU, but he also says, and this is an eye to London, that it would be, um, it would also, uh, that those uh, who have left 
could participate in this European political community. Uh, Charles Michel has talked about a European geopolitical community, not dissimilar. Now, interestingly, and this is because France had the presidency, in my view, and therefore had uh, some access to that text or a lot of access to that te text, the European Council actually uses the phrase in European political community. It argues that this is a platform of political coordination and would foster dialogue and cooperation across a whole range of areas. But two things it says very clearly, this will not replace existing EU policies and instruments, notably enlargement, and it will fully respect the union's decision-making autonomy. In other words, not that keen on affiliate access to decision-making in whatever guise. Now, I'm about to draw to a conclusion, but one of the challenges that the EU has in offering anything short of full membership to those countries that want it is that when you remember, you get, obviously you have all of the obligations, but you also have all of the rights. You're a member of the collective multilateral system. You're there by right, your country's flag is flown, the name of your country is there. Whereas association for the neighbors is always an asymmetric relationship between the EU and that country, because all of the association agreements, despite attempts at uh, trans transversal connections as well, are always between the one country and the collective. And so that's the EU has found it very difficult to work in this space. Uh, now, uh, one of the problems, uh, as I will argue, with concentric circles is uh, it's where the circles lie and all of that. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I'm not going to. The, this is basically the enhanced accession system, and I can come back to it in questions. But. I think in terms of thinking about enlargement in the future, rather than seeing it as a ladder that a country climbs, perhaps think of it in terms of clusters or blocks of integration that a country may join once it meets the criteria, but short of full membership. In other words, can the EU think of giving progressive or phased uh, entry to the system. Now, of course, in the existing system, there are things like transition arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad Bruno is here. I don't know legally how that plays out, but does enlargement have to be a particular date of accession or are there other ways? Uh, the other challenge the EU has always faced and will continue to face is the, uh, capacity of the EU to reform and to prepare for enlargement. Uh, and for example, thinking back, the Nice Treaty was a, a very poor treaty and it took the failed constitutional treaty and Lisbon to get a better governance system in place. And so in a way, Nice could have been skipped uh, altogether, although it was necessary, in my view at the time, to open enlargement negotiations. And then there's the state of the candidate countries. Uh, at, uh, when is a country ready to join the EU? Perhaps all countries, particularly the poorer with weaker state capacity, have always joined before they're fully ready, but they must be ready enough uh, to participate as a member state. And so timing is absolutely crucial. Sequencing is very important. There tends to be, uh, once one country gets near the end, other countries accelerate their internal reform processes in order to, to not be left out. And if one thinks of the Eastern enlargement, it looked for many years as if it would be a limited Eastern enlargement and suddenly it was a big bang enlargement. Uh, how does the EU protect itself uh, against backsliding? Uh, it's doing, uh, where does it, against backsliding and its capacity to act? There is a third, and this is new, and that's security guarantees. 
uh, it looks to me as if when Ukraine becomes a member state of the EU, that security guarantees will be part of that process. Uh, and that is very different to the existing security guarantees in the EU uh, in, in the treaties. Can the EU develop a system where you can reverse privileges? Article 7 does that, but we know Article 7 was designed for one rogue and not more. And then the EU has got to ensure that whatever support it gives to prepare countries for membership, that that funding is well used and that it's not a set of tick boxing and convergence on paper, but that there is deep institutional strengthening going on. And then what about those countries that will not be member states of the EU and the neighborhood? So geography, geopolitics, borders and boundaries are back with a bang. And I leave it at that. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very, very much. This is an excellent uh, basis for our uh, debate on uh, the impact of the war in Ukraine on enlargement uh, processes. So now the floor is open for um, comments, questions, but more generally for uh, a debate on uh, these topics. Who would like to start? I see Dimitris Kolias. I see a hand, but I don't see. Here I yeah. am. I think Here. that you can see yes. me now. All right, perfect. Uh, okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you so much, Mrs. Lafon, for your uh, excellent presentation. And I would like also to thank uh, Robert Schumann Center for this amazing series of uh, seminars. Uh, my question is quite a provocative one, and it's quite connected with your last uh, slide. Um, well, uh, in the ideal scenario that in a few years from now, uh, some candidate member uh, states could have the full, um, could fulfill their criteria uh, for their interest in the European Union. Would you state that countries like Ukraine, that it's partially under um, occupation, uh, this would be a problem, a legal or practical or a political obstacle uh, for their entrance finally to their union, to our union, uh, or that would be um, just an obstacle that could, uh, well, could be bypassed, like uh, happened in Cyprus uh, a few years ago for their entrance in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh so firstly, can I say that I think the EU should not have admitted Cyprus until there was a settlement on the island. It could have, because once Cyprus joined, that conflict became even more frozen and there was a leverage there. So I don't think Ukraine will become a member state of the EU if the conditions in Ukraine are not stable. Uh, and what does stability, what will stability mean in Ukraine? I can't answer that question because it's unclear to me uh, where this war ends. I think we know that, so the West, the Euro-Atlantic area has decided Ukraine can't lose, but it can't actually specify with much clarity what that means. And I think also vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, it really has to be Kyiv that decides in the end, obviously within a wider framework. But given that Ukraine and Ukrainians have lost so much and their country has been already experienced such uh, damage and the evidence, clear evidence of war crimes, then in my view, Ukraine can't be pushed to make concessions that it doesn't think are in its long-term interest. So somewhere between where we are now, and it's unclear to me what the Russian war goals are now. Will they just keep at it in the Donbass? Will they decide at a certain stage that they have achieved some of their war aims, uh, but that they can't uh, annihilate Ukraine? Uh, at what stage is there an opening for negotiation? And it strikes me that there's none now. But an unstable uh, Ukraine 
with its capital being bombed from Russia, will not become an EU member state, at least in my, in my view. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see hands right right now. Uh, here, yes, I see Bruno. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bridget, for this, this uh, excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to make to comment on a point you made and also ask you a question. Um, on, on the point of accession in stages, which you raised, so is there a possibility for new states to join the EU in stages rather than in a, a big bang? Um, of course, we've seen that in the past that the accession then came with transitional arrangements. But what you're after is, is I think the opposite to that, is that uh, countries could sort of half partly join the EU before the complete membership. Um, I think formally speaking, it's not possible in the sense that the accession treaty is a one-off uh, instrument that will enter into force on a particular day. But of course, what could happen is that the current accession, uh, sorry, association agreements with the candidate states are being amended in the meantime, are being strengthened so that these countries could in practice, become part of a number, increasing number of EU policies by means of the association agreements, which would not give them a voice in the institutions of the EU, but at least would allow them to participate in ever more policies of the EU, thus making accession a more, a more, a more gradual thing. So that I think that would be the, the way forward in that respect. Uh, the question I would have to you is about the this absorption capacity of the EU and its future capacity to act. So in, in the hypothesis that we move from 27 to potentially 36 member states, so leaving aside Turkey now, but all the others might potentially become members, 36 member states, and still a large number of issues which are subject to unanimity. Is this possible at all? Can the European Union survive in this respect? Now, one solution that you mentioned is to have more recourse to differentiated integration uh, to sort of bypass the unanimity rule uh, when necessary. But in a number of cases, it wouldn't work. You know, I, I mentioned a, a few cases in which differentiated integration couldn't help. Uh, one is the rule of law enforcement. You know, the enforcement of the rule of law standards, which are subject to unanimity for the time being, well, Differentiated integration obviously wouldn't, wouldn't work there. Secondly, the multi-annual financial framework and the own resources. So the, the financial capacity of, of the EU is subject to unanimity. And there again, differentiated integration is not a solution, I think. And finally, treaty revisions themselves. You know, treaty revisions are also subject to unanimity. And you know, with 36 member states, how could, can this work? So my question to you is. Would you agree with the idea that before the European Union lets in new member states, it should get rid of unanimity across the board? And that is something that I recommended to the European Parliament in a, in a paper a few years ago, uh, when enlargement was not so much on the agenda. But what I said to the Parliament is to say, well, you have a right to consent. So the Parliament should say, we're not going to approve any new accession of any new member state as long as decisions in the European Union are subject to unanimity. We should get rid of that across the board, including for treaty revision. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So what's what's your opinion on that? Thanks. Uh, well, firstly, Bruno, thank you very much for, for mapping out a legal way for some level of phased integration. On unanimity, I fully agree with you. It is, if the EU runs to 35, 36, which I think is in prospect, uh, then uh, you can't have the tyranny of one country or the tyranny of the large or the tyranny of the tiny. I would say, firstly, that the EU should remain a high consensus system. Uh, and in areas like foreign policy, I think it should look at consensus minus one, two, or whatever, you know, in other words, we don't have to go for the existing QMV in all areas. But is it the is it the big ticket item for the EU in the next phase? 
Absolutely. Now, are there any areas that should be, there should be almost a chasse that that you would, would require uh, unanimity? And I think treaty change is a tricky one because treaty change is the constitutional uh, framework for the system with direct impact on the me each member state. So I would argue if you go for less than unanimity on treaty reform, I think it should be coupled with a cross European referendum with a very high consensus threshold. In other words, that you need to introduce some other element than simply getting rid of the member state veto. Uh, and I think a pan-European referendum is one such way, because then, uh, and that you would have, uh, it, it would have to be agreed by whatever proportion of member states you decide, and also by an, in, uh, an enhanced majority of the populations. Then I think you handle the legitimacy of the system. But do I fully agree with you that this is the big ticket item constitutionally for the EU? Absolutely. And I do remember you didn't just do the paper for the uh, for the parliament, but you actually gave it on uh, in one of our seminars uh, about two years ago, I think. Um, thank you. We have now a, a list of um, people who would like to intervene. Uh, may I suggest that we take now two interventions and uh, if you like then to uh, reply Bridget. So I have Christian and Frank. Um, Christian first. Thank you very much. Uh, just to check if you hear me well. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank also uh, Ms. Bridget for, for really an amazing presentation. <clears throat> it was very interesting. Um, I myself am a Croatian citizen working um, at the moment in an international organization called Transport Community uh, in Belgrade. Um, and uh, with the latest um, happenings in terms of <clears throat> Ukraine getting the candidate status, this is also very pertinent uh, in the Western Balkan region. Um, and uh, just two short questions um, in, in terms of um, first, uh, financial, in terms of uh, Ukraine now got the candidate status. Uh, Europe is strong uh, together with the US in supporting uh, Ukraine on this path. Uh, however, uh, at the moment the war is still going on, there will be huge amounts of money which will be needed, first of all, to rebuild Ukraine before its succession. Uh, people are talking about the new Marshall Plan uh, for Ukraine, um, where US plans to participate, but also EU will will have to participate. So do you think that there will be also this kind of, we have a political consensus now on the candidate status, but uh, do you see a reform in terms of, you know, it's it will not be enough anymore as we have the pre-accession fund in the Western Balkans going on already for, for 20 years, you know, the IPA uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, this will require something much different, something much bigger, I would say, but I don't think that we talk about loans, we talk about grants. And of course you have to have a system to implement that and, and, and all. So how do you see this, this uh, dimension of the financial assistance to the Ukraine in terms of, first of all, rebuilding and of course, reaching the standards. And the second question just, um, I mean, it's, it's very far reaching, but we also have to understand, you know, Ukraine got the candidate status, whereas Bosnia and Herzegovina is still a potential candidate country now together with with Kosovo and Georgia. Uh, so, you know, before on the 23rd of February, nobody would have expected that and would bet a million euros that not, that's not possible. However, we are here now with this situation. So do you also believe that there is a possibility that Ukraine becomes a fully fledged member whenever that will be? I would also bet on 10, 15 or 20 years, but before the Western Balkan six or five, However, we want to see it. You think that this is also possible, or do you think that uh, the remaining Western Balkan partners uh, will still be able to catch up uh, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, and then potentially would have a big enlargement? Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Christian. Uh, Frank, please. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Bridget, for what I think was a, a great overview of the issues at hand and the factors that um, come into play. Um, now, I think you were very right to stress that uh, uh, this is a new context of enlargement, let's say, in the um, that uh, the way we think of enlargement probably uh, is quite different uh, from how we thought about it before uh, in the context of, of what you call hard uh, geo geopolitics, because in a uh, situation of, let's say, uh, uh, more benign geopolitics, uh, the EU could actually afford uh, to put its main emphasis on the readiness of the candidates and on good governance and all of the conditionality that has been um, developed at the time. What I wonder is uh, whether we do not now face uh, some kind of dilemma between a, a geopolitical enlargement and uh, one that uh, really focuses on good governance, democracy, the rule of law, and uh, so on. Because, I mean, we we have to face it. I mean, in the in the past years, uh, the EU has uh, spent more and more time on making conditionality more rigorous, because it had learned, yeah, that uh, uh, the conditionality so far uh, didn't prepare uh, the candidate countries well enough uh, to be then um, uh, well functioning member states in the EU, um, but. The EU have made its uh, conditionality ever more rigorous, while at the same time, the remaining candidates, uh, say, uh, were in an ever weaker starting position, yeah, to actually being able to fulfill these this additional conditionality. So, I think if um, if the uh, decision now uh, to to in, to invite these countries to uh, a membership. Um, if, if that has any prospect, I think in my view, uh, the uh, uh, EU also needs to rethink its conditionality. If it, if it remains uh, with the conditions it has now, uh, this is going to be an, ex an extremely long process. And uh, that might mean uh, that it will create the same kind of frustrations uh, that we've seen in the Western Balkans and with regard to uh, Turkey. I mean, it's it's also quite clear that what we see now is another instance of uh, what I've once called rhetorical entrapment, where basically the um, EU could not say no at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all the good reasons that the member states had to be skeptical about enlargement, this was not the time where you where you could actually um, close close the door. But what it what it means is that. Um, and, and this is what we've seen also in the Western Balkans and Turkey is that this rhetorical entrapment might turn into some kind of organized hypocrisy yeah, where, okay, um, we pretend that uh, we will uh, conduct serious succession negotiations and you pretend that you will actually reform. And uh, uh, I think this is the biggest danger now that uh, after this very emotional moment, uh, where things uh, say get into practice, that we will uh, uh, see a long bog down uh, process um, uh, as we've seen it in, in the Western Balkans. Because I, I think we have to face it. I mean, these these countries are not in a better position to fulfill the EU's conditions than the Western Balkan countries are. Thank you, Frank. Um, Bridget. So th thank you both for 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 these uh, for these great questions. Firstly, on finance uh, and what it will require uh, to rebuild Ukraine, I think one of the observations I would make is that public finance has become an increasingly important part of the EU policy toolkit. Uh, including, for example, the use of the peace facility uh, to fund lethal weapons for, for Ukraine. So I think it's a dimension of integration that's growing, strengthening, and I think there will be and is a debate about own resources and how the EU 
gets more, uh, in a sense, rebalances the regulatory and uh, public finance arms of integration. Secondly, on uh, will Ukraine make it before uh, the countries of the Western Balkans? Uh, I have absolutely no idea, but I think for I think one and this links to 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 what Frank said. I I, I fully agree with him on on the on that dilemma trade off tension in the system between how ready countries will be to join uh, and the need for them to have a reasonable time frame and membership perspective, or else all incentives to reform. Uh, are are undermined. Uh, and I would say for the EU, it can't jettison all conditionality because then that's open door uh, and uh, public opinion in the existing member states just simply won't wear it. So I think it would be useful for the EU to look at conditionality and to go through all of those different dimensions of conditionality and decide what are structurally necessary to be a member state of the EU without damaging overall the EU and those that are not. In other words, I don't think it's a question of no conditionality. It's a question of how to design the incentive system. I also think there has to be a capacity to reverse. For example, uh, Serbia is not applying sanctions on Russia at the moment. And if I were the EU, I would use its diplomatic muscle to withdraw candidate status from Serbia. If there are no consequences, then that's extremely uh, that's extremely dangerous. So I would say it's a question of how the EU manages that, uh, that dynamic between uh, the reality of the hard geopolitics and the fact that the EU, and there is a tendency in candidate countries in particular, because they're the outside wanting in, to think that everything is sorted once you become a member state of the EU, as opposed to being a member state of the EU, it's you're a member of a tough club. And in order to take advantages of the opportunities of membership, you also need state capacity and you need a capacity to survive in a very competitive market environment. So it's not, there's a tendency to think that the holy grail is to get in, whereas all the EU is is a set of opportunities which countries use um, better or worse, to better or worse effect. Can I also say more generally, and I think it's something for EGPP to think about or Schumann, uh, is there a case to be made for, and I'm going back now to the uh, uh, to that, remember the, uh, the treaty uh, that the Schumann did, that the constitutional treaty, to go back and look at enlargement. Uh, both cross time, cross space, but also very much at what's worked, what hasn't worked, uh, what might work, because I do think that there's a need for fresh thinking. But it has to that fresh thinking, a lot of what's being put on paper at the moment is very much a sort of a, a reactive response. It could also be at EU level that they should do something like a president's report on enlargement or wise women and men or whatever. Thank you. Um, I now have Yelena and Calypso. Yelena, please. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, Hi. Apologies for the background noises. I'm at the conference lunch break and couldn't find the place that was more quiet. So uh, thank you so much, Bridget. This was super insightful and very, very uh, useful for understanding the current approaches to, to enlargement, also in view of how things have been in the past. Now, regarding staged accession, uh, SEPs in Brussels and the uh, Center for European Policy Studies in Belgrade have essentially developed a policy paper on, on phased integration, whereas whereby they divide the process into four stages, which are coupled by incentives and also financial conditions, 
in exchange for these countries participating in various institutions. And essentially through this um, phased integration, only for stages three and four, uh, a treaty reform would be required uh, in terms of articles 49 and article 17, whereas for the first two stages where um, governments of these countries would have a sort of an observer status across institutions, there would be um, no need for, uh, for a direct treaty reform. Now, this has been discussed a lot in Brussels and uh, across the different uh, member states' governments, and it has been deemed to be a sort of a double-edged sword because it could also demotivate these countries from meeting the, the accession conditions. Uh, I would like to think, I would like to ask you, what would you think about this uh, sort of a staged accession? Would it be um, demotivating for the countries in line of accession to push the reform further and meet all the obligations of membership? Or could they at some point say, okay, now it's enough. We have these um, rights uh, associated with membership. We have an observer status. We receive far more funding. So this is where uh, we want to stop. So that would be one comment. And I very much uh, liked Frank's points before, um, especially as regards uh, structured approach to conditionality. And I would also like to, in a way, pose a provocative question. So you've seen, uh, we've all seen that at the council, uh, Bulgaria's demands related to the history language of North Macedonia, etc., have been proposed to be ingrained in the formal accession process, which I think is a precedent in terms of um, embedding a bilateral dispute in the formal conditions. Uh, so I would like to uh, ask you, what would you think about such requests and how could they change the uh, conditionality mechanism? Thank you. Thank you. Calypso? Um, yes, thanks, Bridget, for a great, great presentation indeed. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to on, on two points. Um, on the issue of the prerequisite for deepening, for, for enlarging, uh, I, I was at, in listening to an, an letter in, you know, at a conference yesterday on the veto. And he, well, of course, he came back to his most favorite um, theme, the veto. Interestingly, he explained to students that the, we get rid of the veto for the most important issues like monetary union. I must say I was a bit puzzled by this because if, if member states, you know, are adamant to keep a veto, it's because they so much care about sovereignty in that area. So there is, I mean, I wonder what you think of, of this comment. I mean, I could see that it's so important that we be efficient, that we get rid of the veto, but I think it muddles the waters a bit. And, and if, if I'm right, and if it's the good old interpretation of why we keep the veto, um, we're seeing now re a real winding back of all the momentum that was for convention. The EP is, is, is pushing for it, but member states have rolled back. So in, in A, we don't know how soon we could even get a convention. It would take a long time. So there's a question here on your sequencing is really, you know, the timing of the, the realistic timing of, of moving to at least consensus minus one, as you were so rightly saying. Um, and I, I don't see it. So to make this whole process hostage to the veto seems uh, to getting rid of the veto and therefore convention seems very unrealistic to me, but I was wondering what you thought about this linkage. And my second point is indeed on Macron's European political community um, and the conditions of possibilities about this. And just to make, you know, three points here, I mean, on Frank's, you know, important, and you, you of course, and yours, you know, the tension between the governance and the hard geopolitics. I mean, isn't the the challenge for the EU now to to, to resolve this tension for not resolve it, but address it as a narrative that that our voice in the geopolitical scene these days is about a certain kind of governance, um, in, indeed, a democratic government, and this is, I think, also relevant vis-à-vis -vis the global south. So, I, I mean, I think we need to think hard, don't we, about the, the reconciliation in narrative terms. And, you know, to, to the organized hypocrisy that Frank is at, clearly 
often that's what we need, isn't it? I mean, as Judith Clark talked about, you, liberal hypocrisy is, is a, both a useful and, and in a way unavoidable um, thing because we have goals and we can never you know, really reach them. <laughs> the means are always more disappointing than the goals for a liberal. Um, but we can kind of approximate them, right? So, so when you talk about the Ukraine versus Western Balkan sequencing, isn't this is going to be one of the hardest challenge? Ukraine can't be slowed down because of the Western Balkans, but to imagine Ukraine on at ahead of them, as you say, twenty years in the waiting, seems also like a political time bomb. I would have thought that the DI vision of your really nice blocks is a way to fudge that sequencing. They'll be each will be faster on one side or the other. Isn't isn't that the case? Um, and in terms of in incentives, that would also in a part deal with these issues of conditionality where, yes, we need to rethink conditionality. Isn't it also about giving much more space of, for empowerment of bottom-up actors, civil society, cities, etc.? And that political community could be a space for that. But to me, but isn't there a question of how it is framed vis-a-vis -vis those countries, not as a forever purgatory, but as an accelerator? So not just kind of, it doesn't keep you from becoming member, but it accelerates your membership prospects. Um, but the final point here um, is that, you know, you said, you also said one of the balances with between asymmetries of one versus Europe um, uh, in, and is that really unavoidable? I mean, to me, it, there is a real issue of the EU addressing the question of asymmetry, yes, in terms of participation in decision making, uh, but also the rules themselves. Um, and there are ways of applying a more mutual approach to rules. And if you do that, then it's less touchy to have this European political community in political terms. Thank you, Bridget. So thank you both uh, very much for for really uh, for your contributions and not 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 just questions. Yelena, I actually haven't read the SEPS paper and I should have. I'm on the board of SEPS. I don't know why it passed me by, but I'll I'll make sure. As to whether it's an incentive or if if you get so in I think the important thing is it can't all be set, uh, incentives. There must be carrots, but also sticks. Uh, and therefore there must be an ability to withdraw privilege as well uh, as to grant. Because I think if it's only incentives and it's uh, only carrots, then you, you uh, countries effectively, they bank, the, they bank what they get uh, and then you get the backsliding. And we've, we've had that uh, in, the e, uh, in the EU. On, on Calypso, on the veto, so I think the most serious prospect in relation to the veto is foreign policy. And I don't think it's foreign policy like a traditional uh, uh, QMV, but more likely consensus minus. So I, I think it's the, the most likely one. I think uh, Bruno's basically replacement of unanimity by other mechanisms uh, is highly unlikely, e even though it may be systemically necessary, but high, highly unlikely. On the convention, uh, so I think it's a, you know, we could get, we could imagine that that conference on the future of Europe will run into the sands. Such exercises have in the past. I don't think this one will. But it's a question of when it's going to percolate up again. So I don't think, given the war and what uh, and the economic shock that Europe has already experienced and the the winter ahead, I'm not sure that the that the capitals have that much bandwidth for for this at the moment. But I don't think it's gone away. And so the question is, at what stage will it get political traction? Uh, and then one has to ask, is there an intervene? Is, is there something that could be done to keep it on the agenda? Uh, on, uh, on, your, on the narrative, I think one of the problems for the EU 
uh, on the narrative on you know the values is that we have member states that are not applying those values and Hungary is not a democracy in any uh, real sense of the word today and I think that 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 backsliding within the EU is a real challenge to the EU but to all those countries that want to join as well because there now is a living experiment two living experiments maybe even three within the EU of, of uh, considerable backsliding. If backsliding is episodic and works its way through, that's one thing. But if it becomes a structural feature of the EU, then that's uh, that's very problematic. And then on the, the rules, uh, you and I have had this debate many times. Uh, I think, so one of the things that also some attention needs to be paid to is membership and i've been arguing since brexit happened that membership has to matter and so it's that balance uh, between the rights and obligations that a member state takes on and what countries who don't want to be members or aren't ready to be members what obligations they're willing to take on and what systemic protections are there so i think that's a very uh, that's a very tricky that's a very tricky business now we have lisbeth and then uh, adrienne thank you hello bridget it was wonderful and so informative as usual to hear you on this and you uh, just a quick comment first on the veto issue. I think it's not just a matter of um, trying to get over the veto on certain policy areas. I think what you know, the functional pressure suggests is that we need to find ways of shifting from a council oriented approach to, to supranational institutions. Elizabeth, we can hardly hear you. Um, there is something with the microphone, or maybe you have. Is that better? Is try this again? Better? Is this better? Yes. Um, slightly. Me... Slightly. Okay. <laughs> Is this better? I'm not, okay. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe you have two microphones in the same room or? Yeah, it will turn his off. We are indeed <laughs> two people in the same room. I guess that, that may be. So maybe. Just, first a quick comment on, on, on the details. So I, I'm not sure it will be sufficient to find the political um, magical way of, of, of reducing the veto, at least in some areas, but I think we need to think of a shift from somehow from council to supranational institutions, or let me put it in this way, from states' rights to people's rights. And part of this will be narrative, to pick up the word that Calypso rightly brought in this. And um, because what the EU, I think, will need with more and more members, more and more living challenges, or more and more boulevard crossing the realm challenges, is a stronger Angela centre. And even if that means a centre that does less than what it currently does. Now, I don't know how to get there politically. I totally understand the political challenge for this, but I can see the tremendous functional pressures for this. One thing it would do, it would allow us to tap into the minority within the democratic black backsliding states and, and, and empower them to give them and, and maintain them uh, interested in the European Union project. So that's a different way of thinking about building coalitions rather than building coalitions on a state-based basis. But my second point is really a direct question and I put it provocatively, Bridget. The word NATO has not, I think you didn't mention it. And here's my question, is EU membership the appropriate response to the very real security concerns that currently these new, these countries who want to come in as soon as possible in the EU, is it the appropriate response? Or is it NATO? That is, can Europe be a credible safe haven or can it change quickly enough its internal absorption capacity, its capacity to Combat in the war in this country. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Adrienne. Yes, I have two questions, uh, follow up questions to Frank. Um, when you say uh, conditionality should be reconsidered and softened and be more honest in the way 
kind of it plays out, isn't that, wouldn't that lead then uh, directly to a form of differentiated integration? And if so, which type of differentiated integration do you have in mind? And my follow-up question to Bridget is, I agree totally with uh, Bruno's argument as well that unanimity is the big ticket, which is uh, to be decided and at stake. The question is, of course, you need unanimity in order to get rid of unanimity. And there won't be unanimity to get rid of unanimity, very likely. So uh, why do you think there could be this referendum be introduced, which also would need, of course, probably unanimity, how would that be able, how could you possibly implement that? Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, I didn't get everything at the beginning, but in terms of the core point that the EU is not just is a compound polity, not just in terms of levels, but also there is a union of states and a union of peoples, and there is a tension. Uh, and uh, I think in order for the union of peoples to strengthen, uh, the European Parliament has always been a, a, inevitably, because of where it started in the treaties, a power-seeking institution. I think that the European Parliament hasn't always played its role in terms of how politically it can influence the European Council. It sees every gain vis-a-vis -vis the Council both symbolic and legislative as being a big win, but actually it needs to pay attention to its own house and how it behaves and what kind of transnationalism it generates in Europe in terms of, as you say, uh, access of the minorities to a European forum, et cetera, et cetera. So I think sometimes the European Parliament uh, is very caught up with uh, formal power and less pays less attention to real influence. So I just leave that I uh, leave that there that that uh, I don't see a full parliamentarization of the EU in prospect because of the need to balance uh, the union of states and I also regard the European Council as a forum for legitimacy in the EU and not a you know it's seen if you're from a from the parliament perspective of the European Council is always uh, is always the problem. Uh, and then uh, Adrienne, that's that's the problem, <laughs> that's the challenge that the EU has. Uh, so where do I think this shift could come from? I think that there will be a shift in foreign policy. That's the most likely next shift uh, in terms of the rules. But longer term, one could envisage. Uh, just simply a different settlement in the EU uh, in terms of uh, with the prospect of 36 states and how to handle government and governing in Europe with 36 states. But I'm saying none of this is likely over the next 10 years. Uh, but will the ideas constantly be regurgitated? Yes, because the challenges, the structural challenges are there. And there's a lot less unanimity in the EU system today than there was prior to the 1990s. So there also has been a slow but persistent shift in the use of unanimity uh, in the system. So it's a question of, are we likely to see uh, more incremental shifts, most likely, uh, or of course, uh, if the EU, um, if the EU uh, is threatened by its incapacity to act, Lisbeth, NATO. So, uh, great question. I think that the war in Ukraine has reinvigorated NATO and reinvigorated the Euro-Atlantic area, but that Euro-Atlantic area is unstable 
And the source of instability is much more likely to come from Washington than it is from any of the capitals of Europe. Secondly, even if NATO continues to be the defense institution in Europe, the EU can do an awful lot in terms of if the member states are going to spend more on defense, uh, one of the problems in Europe is not the amount of money that's spent on defense, it's its absolute ineffectiveness. And the problems of interoperability, the problems of the new technologies. And here, I think what you're more likely to see are coalitions of the willing with different member states uh, doing more on drones or doing more on cyber or whatever. Uh, so I do think that the EU has a very important role in this field, even in defense. And it's also interesting that it is EU defense processes that are the clearinghouse for lethal weapons for Ukraine because NATO doesn't want to touch it. So I do think that uh, there has always been uh, a tension between the Euro-Atlantic and the EU, but I think given great power competition, that tension is reduced in my view uh, the Russian threat has had an impact, China. And so you're likely to see already, in fact, there's a lot more evidence of cooperation between NATO and the EU than has ever happened in the past. I mean, there was a time when the leaders of these two institutions never had breakfast together, despite the fact they were 30 minutes or 20 minutes apart. That's no longer the case. So I don't see it as the EU taking over but rather the EU playing its part in the security and defense uh, field, given the changes that are there. And in the event of a very significant change in the American guarantees, security guarantees to Europe, then that changes everything. Um, I'm looking at the uh, time oh. uh, we extend by 15 minutes because we still have some uh, uh, some questions but uh, uh, frank uh, one of the points made by adrian was addressed to you would you like to reply sorry i i uh, i didn't un understand it this way i, I thought it was a follow up uh, to Bridges, okay. so I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to respond now. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So we take two more questions, one by Claudia, uh, or two points, comments uh, uh, by Claudia, and then Philippe. Uh, Claudia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bridges. Someone has the mic open. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I, we can hear you, but we can hear someone else as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm in the canteen. Uh, I'm very sorry for the background noise. I'll oh, okay. Quick. okay. No um, thank you so much, Bridget. Always a pleasure to hear you and to, to listen to you. I would have two small side comments, maybe. One would be to Frank, actually. Um, I, I, I would argue that, uh, yes, indeed, today's candidate states are weaker and less prepared for, for accession. Um, and conditionality has been getting harder and harder. But at, at the same time, uh, the Commission has been uh, giving better and bigger uh, technical and financial assistance for, for preparing uh, candidate and neighborhood states for accession. And I have the chance to, to uh, uh, pursue my doctoral research exactly on this topic uh, under uh, Bridget's uh, supervision. Um, and so I would argue that um, in the case of Moldova, but also the, the Balkan states, uh, it's not necessarily a widening to, to start, to start with, but it's a, a deepening, uh, a, a deeper integration of the EU's near abroad to the European Union and to the member states before any widening can take place. I hope I, I make myself uh, understood, understood from this regard. And then I think uh, we should also take into consideration the fact that when we speak about uh, the integration of Ukraine and Moldova to the EU, uh, we must consider that there are many Moldovan citizens that already have access to the EU market uh, through their uh, Romanian uh, citizenship, which is very common practice. And then many Ukrainian refugees uh, now enjoy uh, similar rights, uh, working rights, living rights in the EU, just like any other EU citizen. So I think this will, uh, will play in the dynamics of uh, future EU enlargement to these two uh, uh, candidate states. Thank you. Thank you. This was actually one of the topics of last week's uh, uh, session on my, uh, migration. Um, uh, Philip. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Bridget. Very interesting. I have two questions, and the first is on conditionality. If enlargement is mostly driven by geopolitical uh, considerations, do we need a geopolitical conditionality? The problem is, you know, the EU has this mutual assistance clause in Article 42.7, I think it is, in the Treaty of European Union modeled on NATO Article 5, but it doesn't have any infrastructure to make good on uh, this article. So it can't afford to um, admit revisionist states with territorial grievances. So wouldn't the EU have to say, okay, you can join, but whatever your territorial grievances are, forget about them. They will not be resolved within the EU or through or with the assistance of the EU. And the second question is, you know, you towards the beginning of your talk, you said, oh, eventually the EU will have to decide that it has enlarged enough, it's saturated, and it will not consider any further enlargements. My question is, how would the EU decide that? And how would it make that decision stick? You know, French presidents since de Gaulle have tried to say, you know, we don't need to enlarge. And it was almost Im always impossible uh, to find consensus for that and to make it stick. So can we make it stick before Russia and Turkey are members of the EU? <laughs> so uh, firstly, Claudia, thank you for, for your intervention. And uh, I think it does uh, highlight the fact that the EU has also improved as a supporter of institutional uh, change in potential member states. But of course, uh, for these institutional changes to stick, uh, it has to come in, it has to be embedded and accepted and owned internally. And without that, the EU simply can't, just doesn't have the heft to do it because as we know, regime change <laughs> is a very uncertain business. Uh, and there are very few historical examples of successful regime change. Uh, on Philip's two questions, the geopolitical conditionality. So I don't think 42.7 is anything like um, anything like Article 5 in NATO because the member states pledge to come to the aid of a country, but decide what that aid is. So it's not a commitment. That's the same in Article 5 of the NATO. Yeah, treaty. but 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 under Article 5, you also have a military command structure. So I I think that the I I don't think the EU intended it, Article 427, as being the equivalent of Article 5. Uh, on the unresolved territorial issues, so I do think that the EU missed a trick on Cyprus. It uh, should not have uh, admitted Cyprus under the conditions that it did, uh, because now you have that conflict uh, basically unresolved, uh, but uh, still a desire to resolve it and within the uh, within the EU. On that Europe will decide politically. So unsettled borders and boundaries have been a permanent feature of the EU since its inception. In my view, the Europe will be decided politically and not geographically. Uh, and so the question is, at what stage will those boundaries stabilize? Your argument is that potentially never until you run out of countries that can claim some part of Europe's geographical landmass, however defined. Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't envisage um, Russia as a member state of the EU. And in present circumstances, I don't see Turkey either. Uh, but of course, only history will 
only history will say, <laughs> tell us which of us is, is, is right, because there's so much contingency here. We've no clue. We have no idea. Uh, but is the EU, if it gets to, say, 36 states, 35, 36 states, then it's beginning to run out of potential. It's beginning to run out of potential uh, member states. So I think there are, uh, there will be a more settled external uh, border in the EU. But on what time frame and involving what countries, uh, I would be very foolish to predict. Thank you. Um, yes, we didn't mention Switzerland. We didn't mention a possible reintegration of the UK or Norway, Iceland at some point. I mean, there are still some countries uh, nearby that could be eventually become part of the European Union. And some have moved towards uh, uh, aligning with Switzerland by supporting the sanctions, for example, is also uh, an interesting case. Um, there would be much more to discuss. Uh, I think we are really running out of time. Um, thank you very much, Bridget, again, for a really thought-provoking um, and very informative uh, session. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Now, this session concludes also our series, uh, the special series uh, of seminars on uh, the impact of this war on the Ukraine um, war in the Ukraine on the European Union. And we, I think it was a successful, incomplete obviously, but successful series of uh, seminars in terms of numbers of people who have attended, but also successful in terms of uh, the contents. So for, I see many new faces today, just a, a, a very brief uh, summary. We addressed the issues of uh, uh, military security uh, policy, finance, energy, migration and refugees, politics and identity, European identity, core state powers, and today uh, enlargement. And I think this gave a very good overview of uh, the many ways in which, and the, I mean, this was the rationale for the series that then within a week, within two weeks, uh, the impression was uh, after the beginning of the war that everything had, had changed in the European uh, Union. Um, I'm very grateful also for the contribution from the various programs uh, from the Schumann Center, EGPP, but also global, politi um, um, uh, global governance uh, program, Europe in the World, the uh, Florence School of Regulations of Banking and Finance, the Migration Policy Center. And I'm, I'm very thankful for all those from these various programs uh, that uh, uh, contributed and also, I think it was an occasion to integrate these, uh, these, um, these programs and bring them um, together. So this was really a shared initiative, if you want. So thank you very much again to all those who contributed to the, uh, with initial uh, inputs, but also all those who participated. I would like to thank Sarah Bernstein and Lorenzo Cicchi for the logistic uh, organizational uh, support. Um, this was absolutely uh, crucial. Um, I want to remind everyone that all the seminars uh, have, are available online, they've been recorded. So if any of you would like to see, to listen to uh, uh, um, a session that they missed, they are available on our uh, web website and that we resume our normal um, regular series of seminars in, uh, in September. So until then, uh, I wish everyone a relaxing, uh, but also productive uh, summer. I hope to see you numerous again in, in September. All the best. Thank you and goodbye.